Hello everyone. Today we are going to solve the problem of determining the natural frequencies and mode shapes of the bomb. Now you can see that there is a cantilever bar that is that is given in the problem and they have clearly defined the geometric properties and the material properties. It's a cantilever bar. I'm not calling this as a cantilever beam guys. The reason why I'm not calling this as a cantilever beam is because the vibration is going to take place along the longitudinal direction and that's the reason why I'm calling this as a bar. If the vibration is taking place along the transverse direction that is vertically up and down then we have to call this we have to treat the structure as a beam okay so for this particular problem we are assuming that the vibration is taking place along the longitudinal direction okay now I'm going to solve this problem in a step-by-step -step methodical manner so that it enables you to determine the natural frequencies and the mode shapes of the structure just a very short recapitulation of what a natural frequency is when you give an initial disturbance then the structure actually oscillates at its natural frequency for example if there is a simple pendulum then you just give a tap to the simple pendulum what the simple pendulum is going to do is it's going to oscillate the number of cycles that it takes in one second you know that is what is nat natural frequencies that's what a natural frequency is so you give you just have to give an initial disturbance to the simple pendulum and it always oscillates at at, a, at that natural frequency okay whether you are going to leave the simple pendulum at this angle theta or even if you increase the angle say for example if you are leaving the simple pendulum at this particular new angle let me call that as theta dash Okay, so obviously theta dash is greater than theta. You may think that now this time the simple pendulum is going to oscillate at a different frequency. No, definitely not. The number of cycles that it takes for one second, if you just do the unit conversions, then it is always going to be the same. This discovery was made by Galileo. I know Galileo was uh, listening to the sermon and he was a bit bored and he was watching at the swinging of the lamp and he was using his pulse uh, to, to count to find the compute the natural frequency at that time uh, for obvious reasons he didn't have the stopwatch at that time okay so uh, this is natural frequency so I can give one more example that is you can take the example of your spring mass system all you have to do is stretch the spring and leave it stretch the spring to a distance of del and leave it so what the spring is going to do is it's going to oscillate up and down at a particular natural frequency now the natural frequency will change if you change the length of the string okay you can do this experiment uh, it's at the privacy of your room if, if the length of the string is small then the bob is going to oscillate very quickly and the natural frequency increases and it is also going to depend on the acceleration due to gravity but there is that is for a separate discussion but all I have to tell you is that okay the natural frequency is going to be a property of the material and it will also be a property of the geometry okay so for for structural problems it's going to be the property of material and geometry okay the next question that you will ask is that you have to ask is how many natural frequencies do you think there is going to be only one natural frequency for your particular structure or there can be many natural frequencies the answer is it depends on the number of degrees of freedom now the number of degrees of freedom for your simple pendulum it's just one d o f degrees of freedom it is just one for a simple pendulum so it's the natural frequency is just going to be one uh, also for a spring mass system the number of degrees of freedom is just one so because there is only one concentrated chunk of mass that is that is present at the end of the spring 
So the natural frequency is going to be 1 because natural frequency depends on the degrees of freedom. Okay. Now, what is the first step to solve this problem? The first step to solve any finite element analysis problem is discretization. So I will use the word discretization. So that's our first step. It is discretization. All right. So you are going to discretize the structure into two elements. So this is going to be our element number one. And this is going to be our element number two. The length of element one, I will call this as small l. And the length of element two, I'll call this a small l, which means that small l in our case is equal to capital L over 2. Now, we are doing this problem manually. If you are allowing a software to do this problem, then of course you can discretize this into many number of elements, maybe even thousands of elements, and you will have many natural frequencies. Now, if you are discretizing this into two elements then obviously at the end you will end up with only two natural frequencies okay so what you are trying to do is you are trying to determine the fundamental modes of natural frequencies and you are not interested in determining the higher and higher modes of natural frequencies that you can do if you are using the software okay the first step the process of discretization that is over what is, what is the second step the second step is to find the stiffness matrix, I do know the stiffness matrix by the square bracket because it's always a, uh, st it is always a square matrix. Stiffness matrix of individual elements. So that is going to be our second step. It is to determine the stiffness matrix of individual elements. Now how do you find the stiffness matrix of individual elements? The formula is stiffness matrix K is equal to A divided by the length of the element which is l 1 minus 1 minus 1 1 that is the stiffness matrix of element number 1 i used to mark the templates that are associated with element number 1 so it is u1 u2 where u1 is the displacement of nodal point 1 and u2 is the displacement of nodal point 2 so this is our nodal point 1 all right this is our nodal point 2 and uh, this is our nodal point number three okay of course u1 is going to be zero but that's you you have to give this template so that it, the assembly becomes easy for you as you solve higher order problems or as you progress towards two-dimensional element problems the assembly becomes easy if you have these uh, templates that are marked okay now the next step is to find the stiffness matrix of element number two. So let me do that. Stiffness matrix of element number two. Stiffness is a property of material and geometry. Of course, the material has not changed for element number two and the geometry has not changed. So the stiffness matrix for element number two is just going to be the same as the stiffness matrix of element number one. So it's A over L. It's one minus one minus one one because the material as well as the geometry it is just the same okay so this is going to be the stiffness matrix of element number two but as is the usual case i have to mention the degrees of freedom that are pertinent to element number two so in this case it will be u2 u3 okay it is u2 u3 it is u2 u3 so that is the stiffness matrix for element number two. So this is step number two, uh, stiff, determining the stiffness matrix of individual elements, and that is over. Step number three is to find the global stiffness matrix. So here we go. Let me determine the global stiffness matrix. Step number three is K suffix G, where K suffix G stands for the global stiffness matrix, which is easy to compute First, I have to construct a global stiffness matrix. Uh, the way I construct the global stiffness matrix is the size of the matrix. It's a 3 bar 3 matrix. 
why it is a three bar three matrix the size of the global stiffness matrix is going to be the same as the size of the number of degrees of freedom you see the number of degrees of freedom for this particular problem there are three nodal points and each nodal point has one degrees of freedom so the total number of degrees of freedom is three so the size of the global stiffness matrix it's a, going to be a three bar three matrix all right a by L is a term that is common outside for both the matrices. So let me keep that outside. All I have to do is I have to take the first stiffness matrix and fit it in this square. So let me mention the templates. It's U1, U2, U3. It's going to be U1, U2, U3. All right. Then I have to take the second template and I have to fit it in the second square here. That's right. U2, U3, U2, U3. So this is the first stiffness matrix, which is 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1. So let me do that. So it's going to be 1. All right. It's 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1. And the second stiffness matrix, it's 1, minus 1, it's minus 1, 1. And what about the terms that are not filled? Their physical meaning do not exist. So I'll just put 0, okay? So this is the stiffness matrix. This is the global stiffness matrix. So that's step number 3. Step number 4 is to find the mass matrix of individual elements. So I will say... It's M individual, which means I have to find the mass matrix of element number one, and I have to find the mass matrix of element number two. So what is the mass matrix of element number one? It's rho A L over six. It is two, one, one, two. So that is the mass matrix of the first element. Okay, and the mass matrix of the second element, because there is not going to be a change in geometry or material, it's going to be the same as the mass matrix of element number two. I'm sorry, element number one. So the mass matrix of element number two, because there is not going to be a change in material or the geometry, it's just the same. It's rho AL over six. It's uh, two, one, one, two. I forgot to mention the degrees of freedom you have to do that so it's going to be u1 u2 it's uh, u1 u2 so that your assembly is easy it's u1 u2 uh, it's u1 u2 all right the next step this is step number five is to find m global so i'll say it is m suffix g okay so what is this m global well you have to first construct the global stiffness matrix you assemble it in exactly the same fashion as you assembled the stiffness matrix so the degrees of freedoms are u1 u2 u3 u1 u2 u3 you take the first mass matrix and you can fit it in this square and you will take the second mass matrix and you can fit it in this square all right let us do that it's going to be rho a l over six which is common and it's going to be two one one two plus 2, 1, 1, 2. What about the terms that are not filled? It's 0. So this is our M global. Step number 5 is over. Let us go to step number 6. Step number 6 is to substitute the value of K global, M global, in the equation in the equation determinant of 
k global minus omega square into m global is equal to zero so if you're wondering how we get this equation you have to look at the derivation so there is a different different there is a separate video that i have made on de determining the consistent mass matrix of your bar element you can check it through and see how this derivation actually comes in the first place how this expression comes in the first place okay let me do that it's determinant of k global what is k global k global is here we go 1 minus a by l 1 minus 1 minus 1 1 so let me do that it's uh, a by l i'm sorry all right it is determinant of a over l it is 1 minus 1 0 minus 1 2 minus 1 0 minus 1 1 minus omega square into m global which is 2 1 0 it is 1 4 1 it is 0 1 2 and that is equal to 0 now in the next step all I have to do is apply the boundary conditions okay so let me apply the boundary conditions so step number seven here we go is to apply the boundary conditions so we have already seen how to apply the boundary conditions all you have to do is get rid of the first column first row completely and also the first column completely you don't need them because you just have two um, field variables to be determined you just don't need three equations for two field variables you just need two equations okay all right the next step what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide this expression I think I missed rho a l over 6 here I'm sorry about that rho a l over 6 omega square into rho a l over 6 that's skipped outside the matrix all right so I'm going to divide the left hand side and the right hand side by a by l so if I divide this by a by l and if I divide this expression by a by l if I divide this by a by l I actually do no damage to the expression because I'm doing exactly the same to the left and the right All right so what happens now it's determinant of it's going to be 2 minus 1 minus 1 1 all right minus now what do you think is going to happen to this term this term becomes rho l square omega square divided by 60 followed by it's 4 1 1 2 that determinant should be equal to 0 and let me call allow me to call this entire expression as lambda and I'm going to hit this matrix with lambda so I have to take this lambda and multiply with each and every term there and let me subtract the two matrices so what is that I'll be getting I'll be getting 2 minus 4 lambda determinant of minus 1 minus lambda it's minus 1 minus lambda it's 1 minus 2 lambda that determinant should be equal to zero and remember lambda is equal to rho l square omega square divided by 60. now i'm going to find the determinant i will multiply with this term and subtract it with this term so i can end up with a quadratic equation now all right so in the next step I'm going to take those two terms so I will be getting 2 minus 4 lambda into 1 minus 2 lambda 
minus of minus of minus 1 minus lambda into minus 1 minus lambda okay I you can do the multiplication of the privacy of your room but if you just do these two multiplications and these two multiplications maybe you want to take the minus sign outside so first time it becomes plus also the minus sign outside so you can put uh, plus here and you will this term will stay minus okay okay if you solve this and that is equal to zero if you solve this multiply this you'll be getting this expression 7 lambda square minus 10 lambda plus 1 is equal to 0. Now you can find the expression for lambda by using the formula minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a or alternatively you can use the calculator for the university examination this uh, you, you make sure that your calculator conforms to the rules of the university examination. You can use the calculator and you can compute the value of lambdas in split seconds because uh, you are have you're going to have two values of lambda. So let me mention that the first value of lambda is going to be 1.3203. If you just work out the mathematics, uh, the second value of lambda is going to be 0 0.1 zero eight one nine four you can check it so these are the values of lambda now you can compute the respective natural frequencies now all right you can do that because lambda is rho l square omega square divided by 60 and that is equal to 1.3203 this allows you to find the value of omega. It's going to be plus or minus. I'm deliberately ignoring the negative sign because determining the natural frequency in radians per second but the negative sign doesn't make much sense, any sense. So it's going to be 2.8145 divided by L the square root of e over rho and I can find the value of the natural frequency by dividing this is going to be our first value of uh, the natural frequency in radians per second but if I want to find the natural frequency in cycles per second I have to divide the omega by 2 pi to compute it in cycles per second or hits so I'll be getting 0 0.4479 divided by L the square root of E over rho. In exactly the same manner, I can find the natural frequency, the second natural frequency, which is given by this expression rho L square omega 2 square, maybe this is omega 1 square, divided by 6E is equal to 0 0.108194 you can compute the natural frequency in radians per second that value if you just work it work out the mathematics i think okay if you just do this mathematics so let me do it it is 0 0.108194 into 6 okay you have to take the square root of that value and that is you'll be getting the value of omega 2 it is going to be 0. 8057 into square root of e divided by l here divided by rho and if you just find the the natural frequency then second natural frequency of this particular uh, for, for this particular mode the second natural frequency in terms of cycles per second you just have to divide this value by 2 pi so you'll be getting omega 2 divided by 2 pi and that is going to be 0 0.128 
into square root of e over rho and uh, this unit is cycles per second or you can simply call that as heads named in commemoration of the person heads okay now you have computed two natural frequencies so now you know where the story is heading if you discretize this structure into more number of elements then you are going to end up with more number of natural frequencies and why do we find the natural frequency just to make sure that the forcing frequency is not very well separated is very well separated from the natural frequency if they are if there is going to be a match between the forcing frequency and the natural frequency then the system is going to collapse okay for example you can substitute the value of Young's modulus uh, and the density of the material and the value of the length and you can find the value of natural frequency in cycles per second so let me also do that uh, for one one for one problem let us say that we are let us find the natural frequency for steel so the first natural frequency and uh, that would be 0 0.4479 and let us say that the length of the material is let us say that it is oh, let us say one meter why not why not one meter so the length is length of the element one is one meter into square root of Young's modulus which is 2 into uh, 200 into 10 power 9 Newton per meter square so its value is going to be 200 into 10 raised to the power 9 Newton per meter square and the value of the density is 7800 kilogram per meter cube okay now if you try to find the natural frequency you are going to get the value in cycles per second so let me do the mathematics it's going to be 2 okay okay it's square root of I'm using my calculator here into 0 0.4479 if I'm not wrong I think the value of natural frequency in cycles per second is 2268 hertz cycles per second so let me do that I think it's uh, 200 into 10 power 9 divided by 7800 and you have to take the square of that value and hit it with 0 0.4479 yes you are getting 2268 heads which means that there is a bar and if there is a motor that is running that is exerting a centrifugal force okay that is exerting with your point mass at its at a, that is with a point mass that is concentrated here and if it is running and spinning in such a way that its RPS revolution per second the number of revolutions per second is going to be 2268 or comes close to this value in one second if it is making these many revolutions then every time it is spinning at this particular uh, value then it then this natural frequency of vibration forced vibration I mean the forcing frequency and the natural frequency for element one there is a match so there is a chance that the amplitude keeps on increasing until there is a catastrophe of course it is not going to be very practicable for you to have your revolution of your motor to be 2268 hertz it's not possible so your system can be safe but what happens if you are increasing the length of this material or what happens if the density over time decreases or what happens if you are using a cheaper material so that your Young's modulus actually uh, decreases okay in those cases uh, where the variable where Young's modulus actually decreases and uh, suppose the length of the specimen actually increases then what is going to happen is I'm sorry if you are using a material with greater density sorry my mistake then there is a chance for your natural frequency to come in close to the forcing frequency in that case there is going to be a catastrophic disaster okay so thank you all for your patience thank you so much